Good afternoon, everybody. How are you guys doing? Uh, so, just to introduce myself real quickly. Uh, my name is Sean Tracy. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces uh, in the room, definitely. Uh, I've seen some of you guys at GDC. Uh, I do a lot of the engine interviews when it comes to uh, the crying engine technology. Now, I don't work full time on prices, I actually work on the engine itself. <clears throat> So uh, basically what I want to do today is go over some of the new features and some of the new things that are coming along with Crisis 3. And all of these features that I'm going to show you actually get integrated into our SDK. And this is what we license out to licensees. We also give it out for free in our free SDK on crydev.net. So at any point, modders, hobbyists, or anybody that wants to develop a game can always grab this technology and start building on it themselves. Um, so if there's any questions, uh, just hold on to them to the end. And I'll be quite happy to you know, answer any questions. As far as the technology goes, um, there's not much more I can answer in terms of, uh, in terms of the crisis itself. Uh, but on the technology front, I'm quite happy to answer whatever questions you guys have. So without further ado, I'm going to jump over there. I'll be behind the wall there, so I'll be a disembodied voice for pretty much the whole demo. So hopefully you enjoy. Right. So. Well, we're going to open up. Uh, the file name is actually called Canyon. It's called Dam within the game. And it has a good cross-section of uh, some of the newer features that we have. And just to give you an idea, it's only a subset of the features that I'm showing you today. Obviously, it would take us a long time to go through every single technological uh, improvement that we've made since uh, Crisis 2. So we'll just do some of the, uh, some of the big ticket features, so to speak. So just give me an idea of what you're actually seeing up on the screen here. This is our sandbox interface. For those not familiar with sandbox, it's basically our level editor. I, I don't really like calling it a level editor myself. I like to call it a level compositing tool. And that might sound overblown and you know maybe uh, putting more words than I need to. But really, that's what it is. Um, level editors used to just be for building levels. But sandbox really is for compositing a game. You're taking a lot of different inputs. So you're taking code inputs. You're taking animation input. You're taking character input. You're taking uh, and then the level assets and level art itself. Uh, but in the end, you've got to light it, uh, you've got to get the animation playing on characters, and this is where all this is going to be happening, is within Sandbox. And everybody uh, that works within Crytek usually works within Sandbox at one point or another. So we've just gone to a small portion of this level, and uh, one of the biggest strengths of using Sandbox is that what you see is what you play functionality. What that really means is that at any point, I can just hit a shortcut on the keyboard, and I'm actually in-game playing right now. Now, one thing in the editor is actually we're not doing layer switching, so this is why that's all black. I'm just going to hide a couple assets there um, that I should have at the beginning, so my apologies there. Just have a second here. So typically, these are, uh, when you see this in launcher uh, or in pure game mode, uh, you wouldn't see this layer switching happening. Um, it's just kind of a, uh, way that we can manage memory and performance a little bit easier. So again, um, it was kind of a cool example anyways to show you how fast I can actually iterate on things. So I've actually gone and hidden a lot of uh, these level objects here that were in our way of this uh, Vista point. But uh, you've seen that I was able to jump in game immediately afterwards and actually test this. So some of the things you're seeing here, this is a nice Vista point that we have within the level. Um, some of the things you might notice is this cloth. This is far improved over uh, Crisis 2 or even uh, CryEngine 2. We can do it a lot easier now. It um, doesn't require a bunch of animators to come in and uh, put bones and things within the cloth. Um, it's actually purely artist driven and it's driven through vertex colors. So it's pretty easy to author. You can get a lot of nice effects with this sort of cloth. One of the cooler effects is when this chopper comes along. So when that flies by, you see that the wind is actually pushing all the cloth. There's things happening on the ceiling. Um, and what we actually do, we attach a little bit of a wind area underneath that uh, chopper so that that way um, it's going to interact with the cloth and things like this. Some of the other things that you're seeing in here is the particle shadows. Uh, it's pretty exciting and I'll show you some of this a little bit later on in the level. So actually I'm just going to skip ahead a bit. I want to talk about one of the first major shader um, advancements that we made. So again, I've just jumped in game. 
And I could stay in game, but uh, AI is probably going to get our way because obviously all these uh, actions are going off. So I want to talk about this uh, particular tech here being used on this particular tree. So first things first, I'm going to throw a light in. And one of the uh, nice things about the editor, again, is the speed of iteration. So I can just go grab a light entity. I can drag it right into the world, and it's that fast. Everything's updated in real time. Now, everything's it's a little bit too strong, so I'm just going to turn it down a bit. Turn the multiplication. And I've selected this material now. So what I'd like to do is actually just make this displaced a little bit more um, so you can see the effect uh, that I'm showing. So if we go to uh, our displacement, uh, so obviously I don't want to turn this up too much. Very, very careful with this. Um, now, I haven't turned it up so high, but you can see that there's now silhouettes and a lot of displacement happening on this tree. There's a lot of different um, of details, really, that you're getting these high-frequency sort of details. And one important thing, we call this pixel-accurate displacement mapping. This is not using tessellation. And just to prove that fact, i just go switch over to wireframe real quick. I'm going to turn off everything here, except for my vegetation. So you can see that this tree is actually pretty low-density mesh. Um, you couldn't achieve those kind of outcroppings and things that we're seeing. So you see silhouettes here actually not in the wireframe at all. So we're not using tessellation again on this. This is uh, completely a pixel technique, and we're calling it pixel accurate displacement mapping. So this can be used on any assets, on characters, on buildings, uh, pretty much anywhere that you would want some sort of displacement and not have to use tessellation to do it. So that's pretty exciting. So moving a bit forward from that, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the water and how we're actually doing some, uh, there's some clever techniques on this water. Now I'm going to have our solids. And one of the big things with the water is that when you're seeing it from a long ways away, we use a cube map for the reflection. That's basically just a texture uh, that's being used as sort of a static reflection. The problem with that is that if the player is really close um, and at a pretty acute angle to the water, it's not going to be an accurate reflection. So what we've done is that we check actually the angle that the player is viewing this water at. And now, how I'll show it to you, if you keep your eye up here, you'll see a blend as I actually change the angle of my camera. You can see that we're blending in that real-time reflection versus a cube map reflection. Then back to the real-time. Oh, and here's a really easy way to tell. You can see this uh, debug uh, Macbeth chart that's a color chart for us. As I increase the angle on the camera, you see that, that real-time reflection comes back in. Now, we know that our player is usually sitting in the water looking horizontal, so this actually makes a lot of sense to do. Um, and again, we can save a lot of performance from far away if we don't do the real-time reflections. A couple other nice things um, that you're going to see happening is the volumetric caustics. This is brand new, and I haven't actually seen this in any other technology or any other game yet. The other neat thing about this is it's not like the old ocean caustics from Crisis 1. Uh, those old ones were uh, generated, they were a little bit uh, faster to do. These are all dynamic, so basically if I make this wave shape, you're actually going to get a shape of those caustics coming out. So I'm going to shoot the water and then crouch underneath so you can see it. So you can see the wave propagating out from that water. Yeah. So that's really cool, and actually we can make the caustics now affect things that are outside of the water, like you can see it's affecting that cab there. Uh, there's a nice uh, rock over here that it gets affected quite a bit. And we have a lot of control over how this ends up looking. The best places where this looks, and I don't want to give away any of the game really, but it is in sort of covered areas with some water, and it looks really great. All right, so moving on from that, I'm just going to move through the level a little bit. And I want to talk a little bit about what we've done uh, with our flares. And actually, I'm oh, sorry. I'd like to show you on the sun first, and then I'll show you on lights. So this is a new technique called composite lens flares that we're doing. Now, we've always had flares and coronas and things like this, but actually there wasn't a lot of artist control over them. So what we've done instead is expose this flare editor. And just to give you an idea, I'll just open it up real quick. So this is our new flare editor. And basically, we have you know, a bunch of level uh, libraries. And for example, I've selected the sun flare here. And there's a lot of different parts um, to this flare effect. So we have some orbs happening. I can turn them on and off. There's the orbs there. So it kind of looks like um, a water or uh, residue left on the visor. So that's pretty cool. Um, it's got a main glow. 
there's a lot of different parameters, and of course I could sit here all day going over these, but I don't want to you know, waste too much of your gameplay time. Uh, the nice thing about these composite lens flares, though, is of course the artist-driven effect. And it also gives a more sort of filmic looking effect. It's almost like having a film camera on your head. Uh, because obviously when we look at the sun in real life, we're not getting these sort of lens flare effects. But if you're looking at it through a visor or through a camera, it kind of makes sense. So we don't just do those on the sun. Uh, we do those on light entities as well. I'll show you a good example of that. It's these lights right here. You can see that we have a small streak effect happening on these lights and even a little bit of a, a chroma, uh, chroma ring. <clears throat> All right, so further that, let's go to the area lights. So initially I was going to do it in this area, but this uh, this has come up in the build as a little bit of a warning. So actually I'm going to do this somewhere else. I'll just do this outside. Makes sense. All right, so area lights are an interesting entity. Um, in the past, we're really used to working with lights like this, uh, and you're probably used to seeing these sort of lights. Um, and what I want you to really look at is the point nature of the highlight, um, especially in the specular. Now, this isn't really true to life. Um, the light usually doesn't come from a point, it comes from an area, like when you see a light bulb and things like this. So what we did instead was implement area lights. So with area lights, all we have to do is tick a checkbox, and now we're operating as an area. So when I show helpers, you can see that that light now has an area that it's casting from. So as I rotate it, you'll see that it's very precise. And the other thing that it's done is it's completely changed that specular highlight. So if I turn off area light, and I move this back down, you see that we're gone with that point highlight, and then back to area light, we actually have a nice shape highlight. So the beauty of this is if you're trying to light certain things, so maybe a good example is that little low light up top here. I'd probably go line this up. I haven't actually done this here before, so try it for fun. And then you'd line this up exactly as you need, then you'd start uh, affecting the size. So then maybe I'll make the size like this, bring it in like this. So the idea is to make lighting a lot more physically based, or at least physically plausible. So then that would be a good example of that particular area light in that location. Now of course, is the color correct? No, not really, but we still have all the same controls that we've had before. So there you go, that's a little more accurate. Uh, what's also really cool about the area lights is that they can project a texture. Um, what that means, though, is that texture then goes into the specular highlight. Um, so I'm trying to find a pretty decent texture here that you can maybe tell. Try. Sorry. So um, the texture's on the ground. Now the multipliers are a little bit low, um, so I'm just going to turn that up a little bit. So this is this texture actually being projected on the ground, and it's in the specular pass. So you can see that there's actually different highlights throughout the, uh, throughout the entire texture of the light itself. What this means is that you could do an entire area of, say, the inside of a warehouse with repetitious lights using a single texture projection and one area light. So you could probably simulate hundreds of lights with it if you wanted to. Um, again, just a really nice effect. Um, one last thing that I want to mention is with shadows. Um, the shadows are turned off on this light right now, so I'll turn that on. One thing that we do with shadows in area lights is a little bit different, and I'm not sure it's going to be super obvious uh, in this area here. So yeah, there's a really, really extreme change between an area light and a, and a point light, as you can see. Um, just to explain it, um, when we set shadows on an area light, we use uh, a technique called variable penumbra soft shadows. The penumbra of a shadow is just the edge of the shadow here. So what will happen is as the shadow gets further away from the light, the penumbra gets bigger. That's all. Uh, we used to do it only on the sun for Crisis 2, but now we do it for every single point light. So that's pretty exciting. All right, and uh, a little bit further along, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the vegetation and what we've done to uh, improve that even over Crisis 1. So one of the first things that really restricted us in uh, Crisis 1 was the fact that we couldn't put vegetation or a vegetation entity type on brushes. And what that means is I can't actually put vegetation on top of this rock. 
However, uh, with Prices 3 being kind of a mix of 1 and 2, uh, of Prices 1 and 2, uh, as in being urban and still being quite vegetation heavy, uh, we needed to fix that. So what we did was uh, we first allowed the uh, vegetation to be put on brushes, and then further to that, we could do massive levels of simulation on this grass. So I've just selected this layer um, called Grass High, and I'm going to tell it to grow on brushes, and I'm just going to go ahead and start painting. So now this is a small example. Now you see I only have, there's 4,200 of that one, 3,200 of that one, 4,600 of that one, and 4,100. So I mean, we've got a lot uh, of instances of this particular grass in here. And you'll notice that they're not all simulating exactly the same. They're all individually simulated and all individually merged. Where this gets really exciting is when the player starts interacting with it, or even enemies start interacting with it. So again, what you see is what you play. I've just jumped in game. I'll go third person for a sec. Uh, you can even see, actually that was pretty cool, uh, you can see caustics being projected on it too. Um, so as I start running through here, you'll see that the grass is bending away from me realistically. It actually leaves a little path as I walk through it, and then eventually bends right back into shape. So this can be really fun, um, but also to make it even better, we can throw a wind entity on top. And actually there's wind in the level right now, as you can see. So I'm just going to actually turn it off real quick. It's fine, we'll leave a little bit of it on. And then I go grab one of our entities called the wind area. And the wind area can just be placed down anywhere. So it's a drag and drop entity. And all I have to do is set a speed on it. And you see that I have all these little red arrows that are telling me the wind force direction. Uh, but this is where we can kind of have some fun with it as I move this wind around. I don't think you've ever seen anything like this in real time. I know I hadn't before I had uh, seen this demo. So being able to simulate thousands and thousands and thousands of instances of individually rendered uh, grass is pretty, pretty strong. Uh, the other beauty of this is that it works on, on the other platforms. Now, of course, you're still within the bound, but you see that very little performance impact for that many, uh, for that many, tr or sorry, for that many um, things to be rendered on. So that pretty much brings this demo to a close. Um, as I said, if there was any questions or uh, any more tech that you kind of wanted to see a little bit more of, or if there was something particular you wanted to chat about, I'm quite, uh, quite open to answer any questions or anything that you might have. Um, otherwise, thanks a lot for listening, and I hope you guys liked it.